Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. So it is the other Wednesday, which makes it Hidden Figures Day. I want to give a super big shout out to Creatine2018 um, on Instagram, who recommended today's hidden figure, um, Kathleen Collins. Creatine2018 left me a comment that said, thank you so much for sharing. I love this segment of your platform. I wanted to also share with you a filmmaker, professor, director I've come to know through TCM, which is Turner Classic Movies, Kathy Collins. Please take a moment um, and Vimeo her and look her up. She's outstanding. So I decided to do it. So thank you, Creatine2018, for your your suggestion. Kathleen Conwell Collins Prettyman, born March 18, 1942 and died September 18, 1988, was born to Frank and Loretta Conwell and lived at 357 Pacific Avenue in Jersey City, New Jersey. Her father worked first as a mortician and later became the principal of a Jersey City K-8 school that is now named after him. Her father later went on to become the first New Jersey African-American state legislator. At 15, Conwell won first prize at an annual poetry reading contest at Rutgers Newark College of Arts and Sciences for her rendition of Walt Whitman's A Child Goes Forth and I Learned My Lesson Complete. An article in the March 3rd, 1958 Jersey Journal reported that in addition to working as assistant editor of the Lincoln High School's publication, The Leader, Conwell was on the editorial staff of the yearbook, The Quill, and a member of the National Honor Society. After graduating in 1959, she went to the all-woman Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York, where a few weeks after arrival, Conwell became the class president. Her major was French, and she lifted her excuse me, and she listed her loves as New York City in theater. In the summer of 1961, she spent seven weeks in the, in the Republic du Congo with the Operation Crossroads Africa Project, helping to build a youth center in the small village of Moyunzi. hope I said that right, and this is where she first met Douglas Collins, the man who would become her first husband. A watershed in her life occurred during the spring of 1962 when two leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the SNCC, visited her campus. That summer, Collins traveled with other college students to work as field workers to register black voters in Lee County as part of SN. CC's Southwest Georgia project, canvassing door-to-door -door in Terrell County, urging black residents to register to vote, and taking them to the county courthouse to help them do so. They also spoke at the county churches to urge others to do the same. As part of the Albany movement, Conwell was arrested twice, once for refusing to stop praying with six others on the steps of City Hall. The day after she and others spoke at the Mount Olive Church in Terrell County in Georgia, White supremacists burned the church to the ground, and Kathleen was arrested. Kathleen's first two days under arrest were spent in the Albany jail. The woman's cell overlooked an open latrine. It was hot, ventilation was poor, and there were 10 of us in a cell meant to hold four. This is from an interview that she gave. The place was crawling with vermin. Kathleen was transferred to the Leesburg stockade about 11 miles from Albany. Kathleen said that in Leesburg, 59 women were crowded in a cell 25 feet long and 10 feet wide and given two meals a day. Breakfast consisted of chicory and cold grits. Supper consisted of one fried egg, black-eyed peas, cornbread, and water. They were allowed no books. Their time was spent singing freedom songs and hymns, praying and playing cards with the smuggled-in deck. They used part of the time to teach other prisoners about civil rights and voting registration. That was an excerpt from the Jersey Journal, which was published in September 1962. The Jersey Journal praised Conwell's eloquence and oratory and reported that those who heard her speak were brought to tears by a slip of a girl whose vocation is not the pulpit, but maybe it should be. After her arrest, Conwell returned to New Jersey and tearfully appealed for justice for her race, appealed to the heart of humanity for the recognition of the Negro as a child of God, as a man with a bleeding heart in a world that hasn't cared. In 2002, civil rights activist Ralph Allen recalled hearing Collins use the words, I have a dream in a prayer service that day. Although there is no established origin for the phrase made famous by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., he first used it in a speech in November of that year, historians cite three possible sources, one of which is Kathleen Collins. During her college years, Conwell wrote thoughtful editorials for the school paper, including a history of SNCC and think pieces on Africa, 
Red China, Discrimination, Freedom of the Press, and the United Nations. Conwell graduated from Skidmore in 1963 with a BA in Philosophy and Religion. After graduating, Kathleen taught high school French in Newton, Massachusetts, and attended graduate school at Harvard at night. In 1965, she won a John Whitney Hay Scholarship, enabling her to pursue her master's in French literature through the Middlebury program at the Sorbonne in Paris. She took a course there on the adaptation of literature into film, which ignited her interest in cinema. In 1966, after getting her degree, she returned to the U.S. and joined NET, the New York City Public Broadcasting Network, working on such programs as American Dream Machine, the 51st State, and Black Journal. She trained under John Carter, one of the first black editors to join the union. He thought Kathleen had real talent, and he helped her get her union card in an astonishing three years. After NET, she worked as an editor for the BBC, Craven Films, Belafonte Enterprises, Bill Jersey Productions, William Groves Productions, and the United States Information Agency. On her own, Kathleen began writing stories. She wrote her first screenplay in 1971, but later remembered nobody would give any money to a black woman to direct a film. It was probably the most discouraging time of my life. By 1974, she had married and divorced Douglas Collins, had two children, Nina and Emilio, and was working as a professor of film history and screenwriting at the City College of New York. In the following two years, she also worked as assistant director for the Broadway musicals 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and The Wiz, as well as on Lincoln Center's Black Picture Show, which was written and directed by Bill Gunn. In the fall of 1976, Joseph Papp directed a workshop of Collins and composer Michael D. Menard's musical, Portrait of Catherine at the Public Theater. This play was later performed as almost music. One of her City College students, Ronald Gray, encouraged her to direct her own films. Collins was now living in Piermont, New York, and she chose to adapt a short story collection, The Cruise Chronicles, for her first film. The Cruz brothers and Miss Malloy started with an initial investment of a mere $5,000 from friends, plus a line of credit from Duart Labs. The 1980 film eventually won first prize at the prestigious Sinking Creek Film Festival. And Collins' next film, Losing Ground, followed in 1982. Losing Ground won first prize at the Figueroa International Film Festival in Portugal and garnered some international acclaim, acclaim excuse me, but received little notice in the United States. During those years of activity in the early 1980s, Collins also produced equally remarkable dramas. Her most famous works included In the Midnight Hour, 19, which came out in 1980, which portrayed a middle-class black family at the outset of the civil rights movement, and also The Brothers, which came out in 1982, and delineates the impact of racism and sexism on a middle-class black family from 1948 to 1968. As articulated by six intelligent, witty, and strikingly different women, the brothers themselves, the title brothers, though never seen, are vibrant presences through the women's remarks. Both In the Midnight Hour and the brothers won numerous awards and accolades. Themes frequently explored in Collins' work are issues of marital trouble, male dominance and impotence, as well as freedom of expression and intellectual pursuit. Her protagonists are cited as typically self-reflective women who move from a state of subjugation to empowerment. Collins, who was the recipient of writing fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and in 1982 and 1983 a finalist for the Susan Blackburn International Prize for Playwriting, always considered herself a, writing, a writer first. But it was a filmmaker who introduced Collins to the author who most influenced her later work, Lorraine Hainsbury, the playwright of A Raisin in the Sun. Collins said, my first commitment is actually to writing, and the form that, ta that it takes is really largely dependent on what's on my mind. I've been writing now for almost 20 years, so when I first start something, I always go to the typewriter. The older I get, I have this feeling of being very connected with Lorraine Hansberry. I've never found another black writer who I felt was asking the same questions I was asking until I started reading her work. In 1983, Collins reconnected with Alfred Prettyman, whom she had known 20 years earlier in her SNCC days. They married four years later at her home in Nyack, New York, with only family in attendance. 
Prettyman, a philosopher and publisher, was also the head of the Society for the Study of Africana Philosophy based in New York City. The SSAP is a forum for the discussion of philosophical ideas, and it was established to provide a network of support for young African American philosophers and other intellectuals, and to bring alternative voices to recenter the predominantly Eurocentric focus of and lack of diversity in most academic philosophy departments. One week after their marriage, she learned that she had met. I don't know how to pronounce this, metastasized, I hope I said that right, because no, I can't pronounce anything, breast cancer. Collins kept this information to herself over the next year. She did not even tell her children of her illness until it was impossible to conceal it any longer. At the time of her death in 1988, Collins left behind many projects, including the screenplay Conversations with Julie, a film musical she wrote with Michael D. Menard entitled A Summer Diary, her sixth stage play Waiting for Jane, and an unfinished draft of her first novel, Lolly, A Suburban Tale. She was just 46 years old. One of the first Black American women to produce a feature-length film, she is considered to have changed the face and content of the Black womanist film. Collins' work is significant in that it portrays Black people, particularly women, in ways that even now are rarely seen in popular culture. She challenged stereotypes and explored the interlocking oppressions of gender, race, and class. Kathleen Collins, a hidden figure. Thank you so much again, Creatine2018, for this wonderful suggestion. There will be links in the description box. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. Hopefully you're having a great Wednesday and a great week and a great month because it's a new month. Um... I did not do a Black Friday video last week, so I'm going to be doing one this week, this Friday, so keep an eye out for that. And I will see you guys next time. Peace.